Good evening, I'm Liz Barnes and right now we're celebrating the 80th birthday of one of rock's greatest ever frontmen. Here's Charlie Watts and Ronnie Wood talking about what makes Mick Jagger one of a kind. Mick's always been very aware of the stage thing, from playing in pubs, you know, in clubs. He used to do that show, you know, on a stage this big, same sort of thing. He'd often shock us because Mick would just express how he was feeling or talk about somebody, but Mick would have that magic gift. Like many young musicians of that time, Jagger's influences were rooted in the blues and early rock and roll. The Rolling Stones built a following in the early 60s as a covers band at the very forefront of the British invasion. Deep Purple's Ian Gillen, as a fan of the blues himself, remembers those early years. That was another very big part of our era in West London. Before they had their first hit record... The Stones were um, creating quite a reputation for themselves. They used to play at the Station Hotel in Richmond. They were a Richmond band, the Station Hotel and the Castle, Mm -hmm. those two places. And um, I remember when they came to Hayes, and I got the chance to see them um, at at the Catholic Church. (laughs) They had a a very progressive uh, priest there who used to put on rock festivals and uh, stuff like that. And the Stones came, and I remember Charlie Watts and Bill Wyman holding his guitar up, and I thought it was because there wasn't any room on the stage, but it wasn't, it was just his <laughs> style. And uh, then this guy, Snake Hips, I mean, Jagger came on, and the first thing that impressed me was his harmonica playing, because we'd all grown up with Cyril Davis and Country Line Special and that kind of stuff, and the music had mutated from trad jazz through skiffle and homemade stuff through um, to the early influences of the blues and rhythm and blues and that sort of thing, and it was it was all very exciting. And uh, then they they one of the songs they played that night was a, a Chuck Berry song called Come On and Chuck recorded that in 61 and they covered it in 63 um, and uh, it became their first hit record Come on. The Stones quickly established themselves among their peers with many musicians citing them as a major influence Peter Frampton remembers meeting the band back in the mid-60s. Well, I, uh, The Herd played the uh, Enemy Paul Winners concert. We were the Brightest New Hope band. Um, and I'm walking backstage, uh, and they haven't been announced. The Stones are not announced, to be honest. And I see Brian and, and, and Bill, and I go up to I said, what are you doing here? He said, oh, we're doing a surprise appearance. So we're all, like, craning to see when they went. They did the first ever Jumpin' Jack Flash live before the record was released. And we all went berserk, you know, it was just... I, I, there's something about that song, that the way it was recorded and everything, it's just phenomenal. The Rolling Stones and Jumpin' Jack Flash on Planet Rock as we're celebrating the 80th birthday of Mick Jagger, who, by the early 70s, was already being recognised as a true icon of rock and roll, most notably for his flamboyant and charismatic stage persona. The release of Exile on Main Street in 1972, however, would take the band right back to their roots with a wide range of influences from blues, swing and even country. When it came to the first single, for Mick, Tumbling Dice was the most obvious choice. I guess so. I mean, it's the most obviously accessible commercial one on the record. After that, though, I don't know where, you know, one of the things about this record I remember is that there was after the Tumbling Dice, there wasn't really, so what are you going to release now then? And I, there wasn't a second kind of follow-up song to that. When you put out, like, in those days, when you put out, 18 songs it's quite a lot for a reviewer to take in you know what reviewers do they listen to the first three songs and then they review the album and so they never maybe got to Sweet Virginia you know or Loving Cup which are really nice songs I mean maybe not that super commercial but you know I think at that point you weren't only trying to write commercial songs you were trying to write an interesting album 
you know, I think you were aiming for something a little bit more wide. You know, we were aiming for something wider than that. That's Tumbling Dice on Planet Rock, where our celebration of Mick Jagger continues in just a minute with memories from Glenn Hughes and Cheryl Crow coming up. Most big stars in the world of rock cite Jagger as a notable influence and inspiration on their careers. Glenn Hughes shared his thoughts on, in particular, mixed lyrics on songs such as Gimme Shelter. It is, in my opinion, not just one of the greatest Stone songs, it's one of the greatest rock songs. And Jagger's lyrics are beyond. I mean, we all know how great Mick is as a lyricist, but we will really take a good look and listen to what he wrote. Wow, wow, wow. That is, of course, Gimme Shelter from the Rolling Stones on Planet Rock, celebrating the 80th birthday of Mick Jagger right now. And another artist who owes a lot to the influence of the Stones is Cheryl Crow. I mean, honestly, the Rolling Stones, when I think about my the, the longevity of my career, I can safely say if it weren't for the Rolling Stones, I would absolutely not be, there would be no Cheryl Crow. And when I was a kid, just discovering them was like, it was kind of like discovering that uh, that what was behind the locked door in your house, like, you know, what, it was so dangerous. And so their music was so, it was so rock and roll, you know, I mean, it was that to me was like going out on the edge. And I, I love the Rolling Stones. And the thing that I love the most about them is that they took the music that was always getting played on our radio stations, which was country, and they brought it to me, you know, they made it rock and they... Um, I didn't love country music when I was a kid, but they took that genre and they brought it to my doorstep and they owned it and they made it rock. And suddenly it became the vernacular for me. I mean, it was my full on foundation. Um, And then I got to know them and they are incredible.
One of the Stones' many iconic albums is 1971's Sticky Fingers. During what was an incredibly prolific time for the band, Jagger explains the simplicity of a song such as Wild Horses. It's just me and Mick and Bill and Charlie. I think Keith was not there, or we did it before he came, arrived at the studio, and I think it was done in the Olympic. And, um, yeah, Mick it really takes it off, makes the track take off, in my opinion. And um, I just had this tune and just knocked it out really quickly. But Mick really takes the guitar off the solos at the end. Does this one have strings in it as well, even? I think it does, and that was a good touch, <laughs> to put strings on which were really booked for probably Moonlight Mile, but we sort of chucked them on this as well. It added a little bit more uh, sort of textures to it. Yeah, it's really good. You know, that's what you've got to do with these kind of tunes. You've got to really emote it. As a singer or an actor, you have to be able to forget though I feel really happy today I'm just you know so but then when you get down to doing it you just do it but I think this was done really quickly and um and you just get right into it it's, it's sometimes I think when you have to do things over and over and over and over you can lose the the um the emotion of it you know because it comes a bit by rote and I think that the quicker you can get them done the probably better they are these kind of tunes because uh, if you do it to death, it does sound sometimes a bit phony and stilted. Wild Horses on Planet Rock, celebrating the 80th birthday of one of the most iconic and charismatic frontmen in rock, Mick Jagger. Right now, engineer Chris Kimsey tells us what sort of an influence Mick had during recording sessions with the band, in particular when recording the Some Girls album. The Some Girls was a pretty stripped down um, album, mainly guitar, a little bit of keyboard. And it was, I think, the first first album where Mick um, um, played electric guitar quite a lot on the album, which uh, it made it quite a brash and raw album. Um, but that definitely added to the energy of it. Mick was, uh, he was a very driving force. I mean, he was a bundle of energy towards the album in promoting that. Our singer has got a great way of presenting words. I mean, he just spoke. He wrote them and, uh, yeah. He'd often shock us because it was just what he did. It was another thing. It was like if I played a really blazing bit on the guitar along with Keith, we'd be weaving, uh, we'd be breaking the rules, or people say, how did you plan Beast of Burden? You know, we didn't plan nothing. It was just like a weaving. And um, the same thing with the vocals. Mick would just express how he was feeling or talk about somebody, whoever it might be, or, you know, it's quite a few words were involving like scandalous things but Mick would have that m magic gift you know Beast of Burden from the 1978 Stones album Some Girls on Planet Rock, where for the last hour we've been celebrating the life of Mick Jagger, who turned 80 this week. 